Um, good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks for joining today's webinar. Um, this is the third in our series um, that EWT are presenting on the Wild Chat Together Apart, and it's hopefully going to uh, entertain and uh, educate you on some of the issues EWT are dealing with. Um, just a couple of ground rules. Um, as you'll see on the screen, if you, you would have noticed that your microphones were turned off um, when you join automatically, this is just to ensure that there's no background noise and to, yeah, so everyone else can hear it. Okay, and then secondly, uh, the questions, uh, they are, I welcome questions and any questions that you have, I will try address them at the end. If you hover your cursor at the bottom of the screen, there should be a Q&A box. If you click on that, you can type in your question and then at the end, I will try, I'll come back to those and address them. Okay, very good. So, today I will be talking about our recent field trip to hunt for sandfish in the Tankwa Karoo. Um, don't worry if the title confuses you. Uh, hopefully all will be revealed to you in the next 20 odd minutes or so. So just to begin, I thought I would provide a brief structure for today's webinar. And I'm just going to take the video away of myself so it doesn't distract you or distract myself rather. Okay, yes. So now you can't see me, but you should be able to hear me still. Um, today I will be talking about our recent hunt um, of the, for the Tanko Karoo, uh, sandfish in the Tanko Karoo, but um, the structure as outlined in the following slide is just so you know what to expect and where we are during the talk. So I'll give a brief introduction about myself, then outline the role the conservation science unit plays in EWT, that's the program I'm with, before going and giving a bit of background to the project we are working on, and then onto the meat of the talk, hopefully the entertaining part, the hunt for the sandfish. And then finally, we'll move on to some forward gazing, looking forward and answering your questions. Um, so, Rather than myself just being a disembodied voice reaching you through the, the ether waves, it may help to know a little bit about me. Uh, my name's Oliver. I'm 31. I'm a conservation scientist, uh, born, raised, and currently residing in Cape Town. Um, I've recently graduated with my PhD in environmental science from the University of Cape Town, and I joined the Endangered Wildlife Trust in August 2019. So I've been with them for about eight months now. Prior to my PhD beginning, uh, my friend and I went for a cycle through Africa, and I guess it was during this time I'd always been passionate about um, in the environment and conservation, but it was during this time where I promised myself that I would make conservation more than just a hobby, and I would try and make a career of it if possible. And now, five years later, I can proudly say that I'm using my skills that I acquired during my academic career for applied conservation purposes. And it's great to be working for EWT who do such good applied and practical conservation work in South Africa and throughout Southern Africa. Okay, so that's more than enough about me. Um, the Endangered Wildlife Trust is split into different programs. Um, there's a lot of work between the programs, but in general, these programs are there to streamline our work. So I work for the Conservation Science Unit, which is a slightly different beast. Uh, we have our foot in couple of different doors. We uh, try help the other programs where possible and we do our own stuff. So we are aiming to promote the use of science for robust evidence-based conservation work within EWT and across the conservation sector as a whole. Um, so we are involved through project design, data capture, curation, analysis, right through to the publication and dissemination of our results. However, we are also involved in our own standalone projects. And this is what one of these are, will be the focus of today's presentation. So the project I would like to talk about today is the mapping and modeling of uh, terrestrial species of conservation concern in South Africa. So as I'm sure you are all aware, South Africa is an incredibly diverse country. And by some measures, it's the third most diverse country in the world. But it also just happens to be a developing country where economic stimuli are very important for the, the GDP and our country's well-being and continual growth, providing jobs, etc. So marrying conservation and development is no easy task. We therefore need to strategically and carefully govern our development processes to ensure sustainable development. 
The mechanism in place to ensure sustainable development in South Africa is the environmental impact assessment, whereby any future developments have to receive environmental authorization. Of course, this is a highly, highly simplified explanation. Uh, I don't want this talk to get too technical about EIAs, but suffice it to say that the system as it stands now is by no means perfect for a myriad of reasons. But the most relevant of these reasons for our project, the project I'm speaking of today, is the lack or was the lack of an independent data set mapping the distribution of species of conservation concern. So to this end, we have been involved with the establishment of an environmental screening tool, which, will, which is free to use and accessible to all. So what does the screening tool do? As the name suggests, it would screen, it or it can be used to screen future development sites. Um, it not only concerns uh, known occurrence points, but by using, by utilizing species distribution models, we extract environmental variables that are ecologically relevant to a particular species and model them onto the wider landscape. And we therefore can predict where species may occur or where suitable habitat exists for them to occur. So this example is of uh, Breviceps gibosus wearing an expression not dissimilar to me when I after Liverpool lose a match if that I've been watching. Um, so we would have mapped its occurrence knowing exactly where it has occurred and extract those environmental variables that are relevant to it. So for instance, we would use um, habitat type, maybe elevation, uh, what uh, vegetation is required for breeding, that kind of stuff. And then we map that onto the wide environment and then we can predict as the map shows habitat where it's likely to occur. So the darker green here would be habitat where either it has occurred or it's very strong, the, the habitat is highly suitable for it. And then as the color fades away from green into more uh, lighter green and yellow, that's habitat that's less suitable, but possibly it's still there. So essentially through the process listed on the right of your screen, for each target species, we'll map a high sensitivity area. This is uh, where a species is known to occur and a medium sensitivity area where our models predict they occur or where suitable habitat exists. So this is an example from the riverine rabbit, which I believe Este spoke about yesterday. So here in red, the high sensitivity areas are where the species is known to occur. And then in yellow are the medium sensitivity areas where the species, where suitable habitat exists and the species is likely to occur or may occur. This data, is then fed onto the online screening tool where it is amalgamated and condensed and stored in the data, the data bank. And then, for example, uh, if I wanted to select an area for development, I would, in the screening tool, select this area and then generate a report. And the report would spit out a lot of things, but the thing that's relevant to our work is this map showing the relative animal species theme sensitivity. So this is an example, I just selected a random spot in the Karoo. If I was going to do a development here, uh, it comes up that there's areas in the spot which has high sensitivity for Bunologus monticularis, which is the riverine rabbit, and high sensitivity for Aves, which is the Aquila verosi, which is the black eagle, or uh, verose eagle, that's uh, the official name, I think. Um, so if, my sense of, if the development I was planning on doing was maybe a uh, 5G mast or cell phone mast, then this would uh, inform me that there is area, there are areas on my site where I could build that are not sensitive. But if, for instance, my, my development was bigger, like a wind farm, then I would probably not be using uh, this area to build my wind farm as it coincides with high sensitivity for the black eagle and the riverine rabbit. So at the end of last year, uh, Barbara Creasy, the minister for Department of Environmental Affairs, or I think that's, no, it's probably called Department of Environmental Forestry and Fisheries at the moment. They go through names every cabinet shuffle, so it's hard to keep up. Anyway, the minister gazetted that going forward, all EIAs must include a report generated from the screening tool. So this is a great way to independently verify where, uh, what animals are present in sites proposed for development, and hopefully that using the screening tool, it'll save time because they'll re developers will realize that the EIA will not be granted access because it coincides with a sensitive site. Okay, I hope that wasn't too dry and technical. I promise it gets more entertaining from here with lots of better pictures and uh, fun anecdotes from the fieldwork. 
But just to highlight that the, the way we kind of, what ends up being fed into the online screening tool, there's a process that goes into that. And the two things that I've highlighted here are the most entertaining part for me because it results in me doing fieldwork surveys to identify knowledge gaps and collect this new occurrence record when needed. So unfortunately, it's not as simple as just blindfolding myself and putting a pin randomly into a map and going out to explore, but rather we need to make it logistically uh, worthwhile. So we consult with taxon specific experts or species experts, and we identify regions or species that would most benefit from surveys. And then we have to see if it's logistically impossible. If possible, we try to kill more than two birds with one stone. Um, I realize that that is a terribly inappropriate uh, saying for conservationists to use, but uh, you know what I mean. Hopefully, we don't actually kill birds. Um, great, so on to the purpose or the focus of today's talk, the, this field work. This particular trip came about from a workshop we initiated with um, freshwater fish experts from Cape Nature and the FRC, which is the Freshwater Research Council. Um, just a bit of background onto the freshwater fish uh, endemic species in South Africa. They are some of the most endangered species in the country. Uh, they are at the mercy of the twin threats of both habitat loss through changes to the river systems, mainly anthropogenic changes, but also climate changes, climate, yeah, climate change changes, and also the introduction of alien or non-native uh, fish species, which can either prey on them or outcompete them. Um, this particular individual is the incredibly endangered clan William Sandfish. It was once abundant in certain rivers in the Western and Northern Capes, but now only a handful of locations remain. Um, and the picture above is of the Tanqua River. So the Tanqua River was not considered a suit suitable habitat for the fish as it is not a perennial river. In other words, it does not flow throughout the year uh, due to the, the harsh climate of the region. But you don't need to be a freshwater fish expert to realize that as a result of a non-flowing river, it's not suitable for fish as fish need water to survive. However, the experts at the FRC um, noticed that on satellite imagery, that this appeared to be permanent pools that survived through summer, which may have provided potential refugia for the species. And whether, if we could go out there and confirm its presence in the tank, it would be a huge, uh, huge boon to its conservation. So at the end of last year, December 2019, five of us set out to try to locate these pools and discover, if possible, new populations of the Clan William Sandfish. When we were applying for the permit to do research here, we were warned of the devastating drought, but we were unprepared for the magnitude of how, how, how hectic it had been. So this is a picture from the Odebas Kral Dam, which is the largest dam in the region, which was taken around 2012. And this is what it looked like when we went to go visit. There was literally no movement except for the occasional dust devil which would rise up from the parched earth. For those of us that had seen the, the dam in, its, in its, all its glory as a, like a haven for the, for the birds of the region, it was uh, quite a shock. But um, the, the dam wasn't our, wasn't our primary goal. Uh, we knew that it had dried out or we knew that it was in, in bad straits, but we still wanted to see whether these pools were still, were still happening, uh, if, they were, if we could find them. So although it wasn't our primary interest, we were somewhat chastened by the environment of what was going on there, but we went, we set off in search of these mythical pools. So I'm not sure if this picture does it justice, but when we first laid eyes on water, um, or what appeared to be water, we quickened our step, less than evaporated before we got there, or worse yet, it was just a mirage that the 40 degree heat had uh, conjured up in our minds. So it almost looks like we're running towards it there. Um, so it turned out it was water, it wasn't a mirage, but it was a false dawn, um, it was useless water. This particular pool was stagnant and the levels barely reached our ankles and there were no sign of anything living in the water. Um, at least our um, misfortune caused some amusement to some onlookers, a small baboon troop were watching us from atop a, a copy as we beat a weary retreat back to the Bucky's, which were parked a few kilometers away. However, what we came across later that day, we didn't begrudge them their brief entertainment. Uh, this is a baboon graveyard. 
uh, which was quite a unique experience to witness. Um, obviously, baboons <laughs> don't bury themselves. So this had been, I think, in situations of uh, climate and droughts, the baboons are forced to interact more with humans and the farmers have scarce resources. So there was likely this is the result of a far human wildlife conflict. Um, so after licking our wounds back at camp that night, the next day we headed out again uh, to try find more pools and hopefully pools that were viable. I can't uh, reiterate how brutal the conditions were. The landscape was completely bereft of green, greenery, almost uh, Mars-like in appearance, or what I imagine Mars to be like. And the temperatures were again in the 40s. Um, even the locals were seeking respite from the heat, some more successfully than others. Uh, the sky managed, this beautiful cobra managed to find some shade in the, in the bushes. Uh, although he wasn't too happy when I got right in close and personal with him to try and get a snap. I was just excited to see something living that was not human. Uh, other creatures were not so lucky as um, this mummified bat can attest to. He was just found, uh, yeah, mummified on the floor, the heat too much for him, most likely. But our hunt continued as we tried to navigate our way through the rugged landscape to look for our pools. I would just want to draw your attention to the bright yellow dinghy that was perched on top of, <laughs> perched atop of our car. Um, it had taken two hours to pump up and there weren't many people around us that we encountered while we were in the tank were, but people that we did pass must have been very shocked to see a boat in this landscape. Anyway, we continued driving around trying to find the GPS coordinates of the pools we had marked until finally we found it, water and pretty, pretty big pools of water. Um, evidently the imagery had not lied and at certain points along the river, particularly where the bedrock had, was exposed, whatever groundwater did exist had found its way up to these pools. And these pools were, as I said, long enough and just about deep enough to potentially provide refugia to the sandfish. So now the emotions as buoyant as our dinghy, that afternoon we started our act of searching. So firstly, we used uh, seine nets. Seine nets are not unlike the ones you would see subsistence fishermen use. They're just big nets which get dragged, dredged through, the, um, through a, a body of water and try to capture everything in its path. The nets are heavy and the riverbed was uh, strewn with rocks and there were only four of us. One of our colleagues, Otto, took the role of cinematographer very seriously and didn't help with uh, dragging stuff through the, through the pond. Nevertheless, we made a few runs through the pools with nets and we actually did find signs of life, particularly hordes of platana, tad, platana tadpoles as illustrated in my hand in this picture. Um, and the, not, in my, not in the picture, but there are also adults around, lots and lots of tadpoles and frogs and a very grumpy freshwater crab who did not appreciate being our photographic muse. But alas, there were no fish that we found. However, we weren't too perturbed as the same netting is by nature an imperfect capture method as the fish are disturbed and seek shelter through the disturbance and they fre frequently maneuver away from where you want them. What we were really pinning our hopes on was the fike nets, which one leaves overnight. So these fike nets consist of concentric rings of nets which get smaller and smaller and then they are wings which can, which you put out to either side of the river, uh, which don't allow fish to swim underneath. And this guides the fish that they encounter the wings. They are, they are kind of uh, channeled towards the concentric rings and they find the opening, which is an open ring and they swim through it. And these rings get smaller and smaller until they find themselves in the last ring in which where they are stuck for the night, fine and healthy underwater. They just can't get out of there. And then the theory is we had come after a good night's rest and find our fish. Um, these nets can be quite technical to set up, however, and the dinghy is a requirement. Um, but finally, we were, we were glad we had spent those two hours pumping it up, and we drove back to camp for a well-deserved drink and dinner that night, uh, optimistic that when we arrived the next morning, we would find a new population of Clan William Sandfish. So, as I said, the next morning we returned full of hope, only to be in for a very rude awakening. So a bit of background to why this was a rude awakening. The evening before, we decided against carrying our boat 
back across the felt to our cars it was, as we we reasoned it was highly unlikely that it would be stolen in an area without anyone around for 50 odd kilometers and also there was no river flow or tidal uh tidal flow that would unmoor the boat from the bank where we had dragged it up to so we thought it would be safe so it was to our absolute horror and shock that when we arrived the next morning we found a deflated yellow blob and plastic bulb attachments on the floor with suspicious looking teeth marks on them so why baboons would do this is anyone's guess uh, perhaps it was just youngsters playing around or the the valves fascinated them but they chewed on them until they broke them um, however as a result, we did momentarily feel a little less bad about what we had seen the previous day. <laughs> That's a joke, of course. Um, however, our day was about to get even worse. Uh, when we got to the net, we found it had been ripped apart. So now you may think of otters as um, fluffy, lovable creatures, but you'd be wrong in this case. So the frogs and crabs which had found their way into our traps must have being irresistible to the local otter, who helped himself or herself to a nighttime buffet before finding himself trapped in the last ring of the trap. And I mean, fortunately, he managed to tear his way out. So, and that was here. We didn't find him. We just found the debris he had left behind and a destroyed net. So with no boats and no fike nets, the rest of the day was spent hauling our same net through pools to no avail. The stage we were beaten but not quite broken. So as we headed home, we ran into a local farmer um, and we stopped and asked him for some local knowledge. And when you chat to a farmer, they'll generally talk about the weather, but in the drought of this magnitude, that's no surprise. And he claimed that it hadn't rained properly in seven years in the region. Um, and the river tributary, which used to flow through his property, had shrunk to a single pool. So we were pretty pessimistic about our chances of finding anything when we saw this pool. As you can see in the picture, it doesn't exactly scream freshwater fish, but we managed to convince ourselves that we may as well drag a net through it. I drew the short straw and had to undress and climb into that uh, fetid pool. But we dragged a net through it and lo and behold, we found fish. Sure, it wasn't the Clan William sandfish, but it was still something and something very unexpected. It was just a shock and uh, amazing to find fish in that little pond. What this something turned out to be was a population of chubby-headed barb, which is uh, an indigenous species, which somehow had managed to survive in this pool, even uh, managing to breed successfully, judging by the pregnant females we encountered. So this species is currently being taxonomically refined, and it is not unlikely that this tanker subpopulation is genetically isolated from other populations and perhaps is even a new subspecies. Um, Okay, so while the only sandfish we found were the ones we decided to draw with torches under the starlight of the Tanqua Karoo, the trip was not a complete waste of time. Not only will the DNA of the barb, the uh, chubby-headed barb, be processed to determine its taxonomy, but we can confidently say that there are no Clan William sandfish in the Tanqua River. Um, you might think, so why we can say this confidently is that I have uh, shortened this talk a bit. I didn't go through all the pools we dragged our nets through and the snorkeling we did, but literally everywhere we went in the tanker system, there was no sign of any fish. And even when the otter had destroyed our, uh, our hole from whatever would have been caught in the, the big fike net, we would have expected to see some sort of fish bones or debris like tails and scales, but we saw none of it. But this is not necessarily a negative result to not know, to know that there are no fish there. It allows the scientists and the conservation champions at the FRC to continue to monitor the known populations and to do everything in their power to conserve this endangered species. And of course, if we identify in the future any more potential habitat, you can be sure I will be signing myself up to head back out into the field. Um, Okay, so looking forward to the project, um, it's scheduled to conclude around this time next year, but we hope by the time of its completion that we have left a significant mark on conserving the country's incredible biodiversity and promoting sustainable development through South Africa. I think just the fact that this tool already has mammal layers and invertebrate layers attached to it is a step forward, and the fact that EIAs have to include this as a screening report, it already means that 
we have an independent data set which people which people can't argue with. They can't bring their own experts out and say, oh, there's there's nothing here. They will have to run it through the screening tool and hopefully this will make sure that uh, sustainable development and responsible development is kept in place. Nevertheless, species ranges shift constantly and we are in the process of setting up a mechanism where our observation re records will continually be updated and the distribution maps maintained. Part of this process will rely on citizen scientists such as yourselves uploading images or pictures or records of species so you can keep an eye on the space in the coming months. We might roll something out. Then also we're investigating whether we can set up a procedure where environmental impact assessment practitioners who are doing the work in the field, if they encounter things in their records, they uh, send it through to us where we can incorporate it into the models. And then finally, we are also looking at pot potentially expanding this type of project through other Southern African countries where bio biologically, biological data is even more scarce or um, uh, yeah, fragmented. Um, yeah, so I would like to acknowledge the, the generous funding provided for this function from the RAND Merchant Bank. And then our collaborators, the FRC, uh, they're doing amazing work with freshwater research and freshwater conservation. So if you'd like more information on them, I can guide you towards the links that are appearing on screen now. And then finally, um, one of the, the last versions of this uh, presentation had all the pictures on it accredited with species names and who took the photo if it wasn't me. But somehow when I saved the latest iteration, these, uh, this did not get saved. So I've rather inadequately, inadequately addressed this by including picture credits here. So thank you to all those who, who I've used uh, pictures for, pictures from for this presentation. Um, uh, yes, so thanks again for, all taking, for taking your time for, for joining us on this webinar. If you want more information on the Endangered Wildlife Trust, I would direct you to our website at www.ewt.org.za. And if you want to contact me or have any queries or questions uh, outside of this talk, you can contact me on oliverc at ewt.org.za. Right, shall we see if anyone's written any questions, if there's anything that needs addressing? Let me just uh, close the video. Okay, so uh, Ronya would like to know if the environmental screening tool is open to the public and free access. Yes, yes it is, Ronya. Thanks for the, thanks for the question. Um, it is free of access. I don't know the exact website, but if you type um, EIA online screening tool, South Africa, into Google, I can guarantee it will come up. Uh, what I can also do is... Uh, on this Facebook post uh, advertising this talk, which I think you would have. Uh... Uh, I'm asking being to ask answer the question live. Uh, I'm not too sure if this involves typing the answer or just speaking. Um... Oh. Um, yeah, it is. Uh, it is available. Google it, and uh, it'll come up. I will send the link for. Uh, a YouTube tutorial on how to use it in the comments below the Facebook, um, the, the Facebook link advertising this talk. Uh, Craig Miller, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. That's uh, nice to hear that it was, there were some people listening. Um, Craig Miller would like to also know what does the diet of the fish consist of? Um, so I'm not best, um, I'm not best placed to answer that question as I'm not a freshwater ecologist, but um, I believe it, isn't, it's, uh, it doesn't eat other fish. It would eat uh, the kind of insects and insect larvae in the water and perhaps graze on the fungi. But I would advise you to, uh, if you go to the IUCN uh, red listing website and you Google Clan William Sandfish or um, it should come up with all the all the ecological relevant information that you'd need on it. Uh, Christina Seegers would like to know: Was the were, were the surveys done on privately owned land or in the national park? So it was a it was a bit of both. Uh, we got uh, 
permission from the national park to survey in their in their area. We still, our base was actually in the Tangwa Karoo National Park, so we did some of the river within it, and then we also would approach farmers and get permission to work on regions that um, were privately owned land. They were generally, I mean, generally quite happy to let like it's it's low impact thing. Everything that was caught in our nets would be released back into the river, and uh, yeah, so it was a mixture of privately owned and national park land. Um, Brian Little, super cool talk. Thank, thank you, Brian. Um, Grace Nell, great talk. Thanks. Uh, would the Snowbog region of the Karoo be a potential place to find clam, William Sandfish? The environment is very similar, and we have water bodies here that don't dry. Um, I mean, it sounds it sounds very likely. I will have to uh, do a bit more a bit more research onto where exactly the Snowbog Snowberg region is. Uh, I think I know it is, but I don't want to put my foot in it and say it is there when it's not. So I, um, I would also check the IUCN listing for the Clan William Sandfish, and it will have a detailed description of where it's known to occur. Uh, so thank you, Grace. Uh, let's uh, scroll down here. Marilyn, thanks for the interesting talk. Thank you, Marilyn. Heidi, uh, thank you for the talk. I missed the year and season that you have sampled, please. It is interesting to note that some permanently inundated. Yeah. Uh, so we sampled at the end of 2019. So we were there for a week in December 2019 in the, the um, back end of that terrible drought. Yeah, it was crazy to find the water when we, when we went out there. When we saw the dam, when we arrived, we thought, okay, well, this is a waste of time. We're going to have to explain to our funders that. Uh, We've done this field trip and there's no water out here and we have a boat on our roof. But finding those pools and even just knowing that there are otters out there that are surviving and eating fish are incredible. And then finding that small population um, that of chubby, chubby head barb was, I mean, it was miraculous that I was like worried about my health when I went in there to go swim and drag the net through. And then you find a viable population with breeding adults. I really hope that the, the rain that did come in the early 2020 has uh, got the flow going again of that river and then the, the fish can disperse. And then when, when the drought happens again or when the rivers dry up in summer, then they have found themselves new, um, new pools to, uh, to habitat, to, have, to, to live in. Uh, Ronya, is there much research done on freshwater fish in South, in South Africa? Yeah, there is um, a lot and I would uh, encourage you to check out the FRC's work. Um, if you uh, www.frcsa.org.za, so they are based out in the Western Cape. They do do work throughout the country, and they have links to other organisations which are doing research, uh, more specifically located in other regions. So frcsa.org.za. Liam, Liam, Maria, how they? How did you become involved in the EWT? So I submitted my PhD last year, June or July, and I started looking for jobs. Um, funding for my PhD had run out and I'd finished it and I wanted to start working in a practical sense. I, was, I could have applied for a postdoc, but I was really looking forward to uh, doing something more practical with the knowledge I'd acquired during my academic career. And there just happened to be an advertisement for a conservation science officer based in Cape Town, which, means I, which meant I wouldn't have to leave my home and uh, ask my girlfriend to move or anything like that. So that was, um, that was great. That was in Cape Town and I submitted my CV, was asked for an interview and somehow didn't blow the interview and was offered the job that July. And it's been, yeah, it's been great ever since. This is a two and a half year project. Uh, it's great. Uh, yeah. I don't want to sound like I'm uh, being psychophantic, but it really is great to uh, be part of such an organization that is so respected in the conservation community. Um, Jonathan Pulka, hi there, John. I was not too late in Australia. Um, uh, how long did you spend searching for the sandfish in the Karoo? Uh, great talk, thanks. It was just less than, um, just less than a week. So we spent four, four nights, five days up there, I believe. Um, incredibly beautiful area. We were camping, for those that know, not far from the region where Africa Burn takes place. And there was some leftover, it was quite bizarre, there's some leftover uh, sculptures and stuff. So you're driving through this Martian landscape and um, 
you come out of nowhere, you find this weird wagon or some bizarre contraption on it. And yeah, it was, it's a beautiful landscape uh, for those that do like to travel locally within South Africa, highly recommend uh, heading out to the Tanqua. Um, Patrick, how long did you spend searching for the sandfish? Okay, so, uh, I know, sorry, my apologies, it's popped up. After good rains, do you think that a follow-up survey would be necessary? Um, our, our reasoning is we, we think not because the source of the Tanqua, it isn't connected to any other river. So there's no fish in it now. It's unlikely that fish can make it. So the, the river runs into the dam. Nothing can swim up from the dam. So it's kind of cut off and at the source, there's no fish that could get into the source. So it's not likely that they're fish are there. We're quite confident to say there aren't any uh, sand fish uh, in the, the Tanqua. Um, but there are other rivers in the, in the region uh, that are being focused on. Uh, Liame, is there any funding for master's degrees at the EWT? So EWT will, does fund certain um, of their staff to complete further education and they, are, they collaborate with a lot of universities. So for the moment, like we've got a PhD student in our office who's working on the cranes. I believe she'll be giving a, uh, the cranes, I think she'll be giving a talk later in, later in the program. Um, and she is a PhD student at UCT, but also a full-time EWT member. And my friend, uh, my colleague Josh is also uh, starting his PhD on, on frogs and he'll be partially funded by the EWT, but also doing active conservation work. So it is a great way of doing active conservation work while furthering your education. Uh, but for a kind of general master's degree, I'm not too sure you'd have to do it through one of the specific programs, but um, keep an eye on the website. There are announcements of uh, positions that open up when they do. And yeah, I uh, would welcome you to apply. It's, it's a great organization. Okay, so I think that is all. Uh, there are no other questions. Uh, thank you all for... Sarah Allen says it would be interesting to conduct a similar survey after the rains, but stay next to the river to keep an eye on the nets and otters. If it's called sandfish, is there any chance that the fish may bury themselves during the drought? Um, the sandfish, I don't know exactly where the name comes from, but I can tell you it's not because they bury themselves during the sand. I think it's in the sand. I think it's called because their color of this, of their uh, scales was very similar to the, the, the rocks and sand of the of the rivers in the area. Uh, but if that is an error, then don't hold me to account for that. Uh, yeah, I think maybe there would be a scope for another survey, but we, these surveys are, are not cheap to conduct. We, we would have to, we'd have to see the logistics. There are other species that going forward, we're looking forward to looking at. Um, but the FRC are doing stellar work with conservation of freshwater species and freshwater habitats in the Western Cape and throughout the country. So if they wanted some uh, logistical support and we could uh, get together a proposal to do another survey, that would be, well, from my point of view, at least very welcome. Um, okay, great guys. Thank you very much for joining. Um, keep an eye on EWT social media channels as there will be further talks coming up through the course of the lockdown. And uh, yeah, stay safe. I hope your loved ones stay safe in these unprecedented times and stay stay healthy okay i am signing out thanks guys stay well stay safe